I have no idea. Sorry, I've not been following it. <laughs> Manchester <laughs> City? Oh, oh, decent guess, that, decent guess. I'm so disappointed. In you. <laughs> not that I won them. I'm a United fan. I was I was born. Are you? Fan. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't think United had been doing very well though from my last chats with my dad. Maybe they're better now. Have they got a bit Damien, better? This, this is getting worse and worse, Damien. I've got an Arsenal fan <laughs> and a United fan. Thank you very much, Jasmine and Damien, uh, for joining me on uh, film my run. Um, I imagine that uh, you've done a number of interviews already, Jasmine. Tell me how many you've done. Uh, I don't. I'm. I'm not sure. Um, but I, I know that I did sort of in the region of thirty last week in in a few days. So um, this week I'm back at work. So just the most I can do is like a couple in the evening once the kids are asleep. But um, yeah, I'm going camping next week in the lake. So I'm looking forward to just leaving all my uh, kind of connection to the outside world behind and just enjoying some time in the hills with the family. Thirty is a lot, Demo. Do you wish you'd done thirty in two weeks? <laughs> As as we're, you, I think the secret is, yeah, you stop you stop early so that people aren't really interested in you. Uh, that's 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 the secret. Um, don't hey, don't worry, we're going to come on to that. <laughs> oh, drat! But then you have to talk about your failure. So yeah, um, pros so and cons. For for those watching, uh, we we are going to assume that you know who Jasmine Paris and Damien Hall are. We are going to assume that you know a heck of a lot about what the heck the Barclay Marathons is, because we could spend hours and hours talking about what the Barclay is. We could spend even longer talking about Damien and Jasmine's portfolio. I mean, where do we start? Damien's obsession with UTMB and his previous obsession with the spine uh jasmine's obsession with the spine and both of their obsessions with the barclay marathons um and that is just a tiny amount you've both done monte rosa as well haven't you both yeah, of you yeah. um so so we are you know i i'm sure that everybody watching is well aware of of what you guys have done but we're going to concentrate on the barclays Jasmine, when when did you first kind of hear about the Barclays? How long ago did it enter your consciousness? I'm not I'm not even sure when I first heard about it, like a long time ago. But I can say when I kind of first became aware of it as like properly aware of it was after the spine when a number of people said to me um that, that you know, that Laz had said in an interview that he was keen to see me try Barclay. And at that point I wasn't super convinced by the idea of re running laps in a forest but it sort of grew on me it was one of those things it was like the spine that grew on me in the same way and then sometime when my son was maybe like nine months old or something um I suddenly decided suddenly knew one day that I wanted to do it and that was like a that was the moment that I was waiting for because you have to go to that race like 100% wanting to do it you have to be all in I think if you want to finish what about you Damien when did you first come across it I think I think it was Right at the beginning, when I was learning about all these different ultra marathons, um, I think it was my local friend and, and bad idea hawker um, Alex Copping, who was the only real ultra runner I knew at first. And we, we'd go for a run on a Sunday, and I'd always be pestering him about different races. You know, what are the what are the races? You know what? And I, I remember, I think I said, you know, what's the toughest race? Or you know, and he started telling about this one. You know, this one in Tennessee with the books in the woods. And I remember thinking that you know that sounds pretty crazy and then of course it just stays in your consciousness um, and when I really started getting more interested was probably after running the Penang Way um, and setting a record in 2020 when yeah I was doing more interviews and I don't know if Jasmine's had the same but so many times you do an interview whether it's a podcast or, or, or sort of a live thing and nearly always at the end someone says what about the Barclay when are you going to do the Barclay <laughs> and after several years of that you're like well I flipping better give it a go I suppose um then you've got to work out how to get in but um but then even then actually I was on the wait list for two years so um I was and then we had yeah the COVID thing as well so it's complications so yes it's been a long time a long time coming you you talk you still talk Damien like you're a new runner because I remember that kind of I remember um people saying to me oh are you going to do UTMB? That's that's the one everyone does, you know. And you you still talk with that kind of enthusiasm of of like I've I've only just started running, but you know you've been around for years, mate. 
That may be true, but honestly, I'm I'm just as in love with this 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 sport, this these adventures as I was when I first started. You know, did my first ultra marathon, um, twenty twelve, pretty sure it was, and and just this whole world opens up to you, doesn't it? Of of you know, the, there's so many different events. It doesn't even have to be an event, and and I just love it. I just love it, and I, you know, I've come back. You know, in some ways, I've failed, but I've had an amazing adventure, uh, and and it's you know, it's quite good, I think, to remind yourself that quite early on you didn't get the result you wanted but wow you know I've got memories for a lifetime you know partly thanks to this lady here but um yeah so I yeah I just I still absolutely love it and I hope that never goes Jasmine so when you started to think about Barclay can you identify what it was that that made you think right okay I actually want to do this now and I and what made you think that you genuinely had a chance you ask it so I'll start um I it's an interesting thing but when I signed up for the spine it was when my daughter was like less than a year old and the same with the Barclay and it in in with my son and I and I feel like it's um something about coming back to running it's hard to kind of it's hard to have a a baby and um go through the pregnancy and then kind of all the initial kind of post-birth thing and getting fit again it's hard to do that and in some ways it's it's brilliant to have uh, something to motivate you and it, especially if it's something that's not the same as what you were doing before it's like a different challenge you'd have nothing to compare it to it's something that you're really excited about and that's the way it was with the spine for me I was suddenly really excited about this thing that I had no idea I had no prior kind of concept of how I could do in this. So there was no expectation in my mind. It was just open um, to, to how, I, how it would go, you know. I didn't have to compare myself with how I was before I had this child. I was just starting again. Um, and it was, a, it was an incredible kind of source of motivation, just knowing that I was going to have to run 268 miles in the case of the spine. And then it was the same for the Barclay. It had that same feel to it, like of like suddenly, you know, I've got something to work towards again and I've got a reason to get fit. And so for me, that was like a big motivator. And then just, you know, I've sort of said in multiple interviews, but then the kind of excitement of not knowing, of like firstly, the kind of kind of the nervous anticipation of not knowing what this kind of race that's so legendary is actually all about. Um, and then not knowing whether you can finish it, because statistically speaking, the likelihood is you can't. And yet, clearly, it is possible. So, and then I guess the, for me, um, I've always been kind of excited by the idea of being told that I, that something's impossible. Especially if somebody says it's impossible for a woman, then that's immediately the mm -hmm. thing that would kind of make me say, "Well, like you know, watch me, um, kind of um, watch me try." And um, so I was prepared to go there the first time and sit and you know find out maybe it is impossible but I needed to see for myself first and actually what happened is I went there and I was like I think this is possible and um, it's just going to take a bit of effort so yeah so so when you when you um went in 2022 it wasn't a case that you you went around the first couple of loops and thought blimey this this is not going to be doable at all then no um I went around the first loop and there was still quite a lot of people together I think it's just a kind of standard first leap of Barclay when most people kind of get round, the faster people get round in, I guess, eight and a half to nine and a half hours. And I sort of did roughly that. I think it was nine and a quarter. Um, but that year we had incredible rain on the second on the second loop in the night. Um, and I had quite a lot of gear with me, partly because I knew it was going to be wet and partly because I kind of come from a fell running background where you have to be capable of looking after yourself in wild places and you carry a lot of kit being used to running in Scotland. And so I was OK. I was like I was a bit cold, but um, I had a lot of gear with me and I had fleece and extra layers and heavy waterproofs and all that. And I kind of was came through the night OK. And um, whereas I think most people dropped out I think it was five people left at the end or something and that went out kind of on on after after the end of loop two so it was more that it was yeah certainly on loop three I made incredible number of mistakes um which I learned from for future years but um it took me a very long time and actually it was very dramatic the end of loop three for me on that first year because I sort of came the wrong way off the ridge and um it was a it was a real sprint to get back to the gate which <laughs> is from the opposite side to this time but um yeah to get back to the gate for 40 hours for a fun run but I definitely came away from it thinking I did I did made so many mistakes I could definitely do a lot better um especially if the weather was better the legendary nature of Barclay people who haven't been there and, and I'm one of them we tend to think of you know the way they talk about the steep inclines and the briars you imagine that it's like nothing you've ever experienced before either of you D Damien what 
you know, you, you've done the spine, you've done, you've both done fell runs, you've done the rounds. Is it like, is it like anything that you've experienced before? I think, I guess no. Uh, probably the rounds are the most similar because you take the more direct route straight up something steep. So on the Paddy Buckley going up something like Knicked, uh, that's probably the most similar uh, for that, that, you know, there'll only be a very few people nodding perhaps at that. But um, I mean, it's say, say the Tour de Gion or, or UTMB, you know, there's lots of vert, you know, uh, but it's, it's often switchbacks. So you're not actually moving that steeply. Um, and at the, t yeah, at, at Barclay, I feel like your, your knees are up to your, you know, <laughs> you know, above, above your hips quite, quite often, you know, and your, your, your poles, I can't imagine doing it without poles, your poles are, you're clinging desperately to your poles to pull yourself up the hill. Um, it's very steep. And Jasmine, actually, I don't know if she remembers, but when I first asked her what it was like, she said, you're either, you're either hiking steeply up or sliding down. Um, and, and, but I mean, it, some of that's great fun. I mean, the, the downs can be good fun. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty to them. The sort of clinging to trees and not sure whether the branches will snap off and underfoot. Often it's relatively safe, but there are always moments where suddenly it isn't. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's not it's not just pure hell out there. There it's, and, it, and it can be can be beautiful. Um, but yeah, I, I guess a fell running round would be the most similar that we've got. Um, but it's still different. It's still different to that. I mean, I think I I remember either hearing an interview or seeing something written, Jasmine. You said that the, this year the first loop was like just going on any other trail run. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> trail Not running. Quite. I mean, I guess things, you know, this year, I guess it was interesting how many people were together this year. Damien will probably agree. There was a lot of people together at the start of this year. Um, we started at kind of a pretty good time. So we kind of had, I guess, darkness for the f very first bit, but then it was, you know, into sunshine and daylight. And um, yeah, and um, there was a kind of a few new book locations that kind of brought people back together a bit. So there was... You know, it felt it felt kind of quite sociable and I would say for the first two thirds of the first loop this year um I wouldn't say a trail run in the sense that like as Damien said I agree with everything that Damien said um in terms of kind of vert and um there's this new section of the course that was very brambly um so that wasn't you know that was definitely not a trail run um in that sense <laughs> I think I think we all all cursed a bit as we went through it five times in some cases yeah <laughs> I I mean I you know the things that you say, you know, I, I remember I've done not the Glencoe, but, but uh, the Ben Nevis Ultra. And I remember sliding down half a mountain on my backside during that. And then I remember in Trans Gran Canaria, it was so steep and so wet one year that we were we were pulling on branches to get ourselves up this horrendous slope. I imagine that that there are there are sections of a lot of races that are a little bit similar but put it all together and it just becomes this kind of totally other other thing does does the vert the the actual amount of elevation does that did that frighten you did that um put you um did that worry you at all Do you want to start five loops? Um, either of you yeah um i guess it just makes it very slow um and I think most people, you know, if they've got a place, they will, you know, they will be aware. There's a lot of, uh, we think, possibly up to 14,000 foot per, per loop. Um, and yeah, you, you train, you, you train accordingly. You, you try and get in some, some steep vert. Um, yeah, what's interesting with the navigation is that, you know, yeah, going up is um, often a lot easier navigationally than, than we often have problems on the long descents where it, where the, the hill splits into several spurs at the bottom, and then it's trying to make sure you're on that right spur, um, and you're often you're often not. Um, so it adds a yeah, it adds an element, a, a navigation element there. But um, I don't know. I've always enjoyed. I suppose I've always enjoyed rounds and races that have a lot of vert. So it's not that's not a big, I suppose, fear factor for me necessarily. Um, yeah. What did you do, Jasmine, in training leading up to this year? How did you say? What yeah. did you do in training leading up to this year? Uh, I guess I think me and Damien pro probably both, we did quite a lot of vert. Um, I did, um, yeah, I, I guess I was kind of for longer runs, I was tending to, when I was trying to maximise vert, vertical ascent, I was kind of finding a hill that had 
was fairly steep um, that I could get kind of the most climb I could get in in a shorter distance and they're just running up and down I did definitely did multiple sessions um, of certainly long runs where I would do just go up and down the same hill multiple times like one one night where I actually ran overnight 17 times up and down the local hill in a kind of blizzard stroke sleet storm um, so that was kind of a memorable one and then running up Ben Ledy five times or near calendar when I was on holiday there and uh, one morning so that sort of thing but also did did kind of double sessions of like training of doing like a stair climber session in the in the evening before getting the kid from nursery and after school club just about sneaking it in and then a cycle commute when I'm working doing research though that's kind of an extra bit of training and then quite a lot of strength work I definitely did more I know Damon's been doing that for a while but I definitely did more weighted strength work I did a lot more with weights this time than I've done before and it was really useful because I've got a chronic knee problem I've got an, I've got a missing I tore my anterior cruciate ligament when I was 17 and that knee's not been great for the last few years but this year was for Barkley was incredible I didn't even have any swelling or anything afterwards and that's the first time in years that, that it's been that good so I was really impressed it was really good <laughs> do you do you have to have a good year to get this finished in terms of do you have to have the start time at the right time? Do you have to have decent weather to make this a doable race? I mean, I can say what I, I think. I'm not sure that the start time is that important, but I do think the weather is important. Um, certainly in the sense that I think if you had bad weather, then it, it would very quickly become impossible almost impossible to finish just As because if you look at the kind of time, times that people run you know even the fastest time is just just over an hour you know kind of inside the cutoff and, and most people are sort of more like the 40 to 20 to 40 minutes inside the cutoff of the finishes this year um so I mean you only need bad weather making it a bit more slippy a bit of a mist to make navigation harder and then I think you make it virtually impossible. But I don't know, I, I, I pass over to Damien, but that's my personal opinion that the weather's a huge factor. Well, um, <laughs> this is why it's to my frustration because I've, I've only really done the Barclay in good weather. Um, yeah, I haven't tasted this infamous Barclay fog that, that, that some other you know people more experienced than me talk about. Um, and yeah, you had that rain in the first year, which I haven't tasted um so that's yeah i feel like that's what these last two years feel like a bit of a wasted opportunity in that we've had such good weather but um yeah who knows john there'll be more years like that damien there, john kelly said that um because let's talk about navigation briefly as well uh john yeah, said that you you are a, a ma jasmine you are a master navigator it how important is it from loop one or how or also how much of a detriment could it be on loop five if you are running with experienced Barkley runners like Jared and like John? You I mean how, how much of a help is it? Would it be would it well, be on Well loop? it could well it could see from from outside looking in, it's great that you get that experience by going round with runners who've done it before, who right, know the yeah. course, who can help you initially find the first few books and, and you can work together. But then I don't know if Damien, if this is, is, is something that, that has, has been your problem, but is it that final loop where essentially you're on your own? And you have to do all that navigation yourself, having possibly not actually done it on the first four loops by yourself. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll kind of answer for myself, but um, in some ways, I was, <laughs> in some ways, I was lucky that I couldn't keep up in the first two years that well <laughs> with the lead group because basically, it forced me to make all the mistakes. Um, and uh, it's, John's very kind saying that, but I made a lot of mistakes the first two t times I, I did it on my own. Um, certainly, you know, just as an example, last year in the fourth loop, I made a, probably a similar to mistake to the one that Damien made this year, maybe a little bit less dramatic. Um, but, um, but you know, and multiple people have made that same sort of mistake, descending slightly the wrong angle off that um, off that ridge, I guess. Um, so the first year, the first year, as I say, on loop three, I think it must have taken me like 16 hours or something. And I made like every mistake in the book almost. But I I learned from those. And the remarkable thing was that this year, um, 
I mean, this year I went into it thinking I, I've learned I've learned my way around this course. What I need to be able to do is be a bit faster in the first few loops so that I can kind of cash in on knowing what I'm doing navigationally in the later ones because when I can go a bit more slowly and um, when I need to go a bit more slowly because I'm kind of tired. Um, so um, I really I really benef benefited from those prior mistakes this year. So, for example, when we were running with John and there was a, you know, a couple of points where maybe we were about to make a mistake or we did something and I actually spotted, I was like, I've done this before and I know what, what we're about to do um and we were you know maybe able to point it out but it was only because i'd done i'd made the mistake before um, and so there are obviously things that are easy to do out there um and and yeah and it, and it really helps to have kind of recognized before that you you know to recognize that early and you just get more careful you get more careful about trying to make sure that you're on the right spur and um and you know looking at your compass regularly and things but it's not easy you know the more you look at the compass going downhill the more likely you are to land on your bottom and that that happened to be a lot on loop five when i was really kind of trying to navigate carefully so come on damien what what did happen loop five well, it, because it, the it, first it's... you know for both of you looking looking at keith dunn's tech tweets the first four loops were like a breeze for all of you it was a, it was a walk in the park it was like a 10k not not me <laughs> on the seafront <laughs> That's, that's not the way I was feeling at the end of the week four, I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, Damien, tell me what, what, what happened on loop five? Well, it is interesting because Jasmine and I have almost learned the Barclay from the opposite, the opposite directions. And, um, and certainly the advice from reading, reading blogs before my first go was, you know, if you're a virgin, you've got, you've got to go with a veteran and learn all you can. Um, and yeah, and both years I've, <laughs> stuck with stuck with with veterans and yeah for a good four loops and i was very, i was really thrilled last year i was like i've got the physically i feel like i can get around um and then when it came to being on my own i think last year it was more of a kind of sleep deprivation meltdown and confusion um <laughs> it, yeah um and this year i was more conscious to try and to be trying to learn um certainly john john encouraged it as well i did that i did the sort of i think it must have been loop Three or four, Jasmine. I don't think you're with us it anymore. Was, but I did the sort of. You were on loop three. Um, did I do most I, of stallion? I, I was when there, you were there when he was offering opportunities to navigate. Okay. Yeah. I so did. I think I did most of the stallion section, which is the section that's always baffled me the most. Um, although I remember book, yeah, book nine, which won't mean much to many people, was still was still tricky. A new a new one. Um, so I was gaining some confidence, but yeah, ultimately I, I need to be better on my own. Um, whether that's yeah, I mean, I've, I've I've got an obvious area to work on, which which is which is kind of exciting. Like, if it was baffling how I couldn't do it, it would be more more frustrating. It's you know, it's clear, it's clear I, that you know, navigating on my own in the dark is what I need to improve on. I was and more the, gutted the than you, Damien. I was more gutted than you. I was. I'd already tweeted. I'm absolutely convinced Damien is coming oh. in. I. <laughs> well, the the, I the was... mantra from John. What it was really illuminating, actually. Yeah, John was. You know, he did. He's been open that he made. You know, he was in charge of, of the nav quite, you know, quite a lot of the time, or at least he was backing up people. And he made quite a few mistakes, but he's very quick at spotting them and very quick at correcting them. And the thing was, don't let a small mistake become a big mistake. So, mm -hmm. like, small mistakes, are, they're inevitable, really, especially as you get tired and it's dark. But, uh, yeah, that's what happened to me. A small mistake became a, became a big mistake. And I still found the book, but I just took too long, um, frustratingly. But, um, yeah, um, you know, I, I, I'm... Well, I don't know Jasmine. if I'm meant to talk about it, but yeah, I want to go. I want to. I want to correct those mistakes. Yeah, I I know you're going back. You, if, if you said to me you weren't going back, I would have words with you. <laughs> uh, Jasmine, I need to redeem your tweet. When when somebody who doesn't know about the Barclay uh, looks at how long it takes you to do twenty ish <laughs> miles, I mean, it, how long is it? Twenty four, twenty five miles, and we d nobody knows, do they? Do you know? No. Uh, <laughs> anyway, who cares? But but eight, nine, 10, 13 hours to do that distance. What what is it that takes the time? Is it the climbing or is it the finding the books? I, I think I mean when you're actually in the right place, which sounds obvious, finding the books is not is not, you know, a difficult thing. I would say once you once you find the right spot, like roughly within I know 20 meters you'll recognize the surroundings and you then you find the book um with the exception that you know 
if it's a, in a completely new location, it might take you a little bit, a little while to initially locate it. But then after that, you know where it is. Um, it's being in the right place. Um, so like, as Damon said, you descending from a, from one of the tops and you on the wrong spur and then suddenly you find yourself by a river and are you too far down the river or are you too far up the river and then make working that out. So that's the kind of challenge of it. Um, I'd say that if you, if you're not making a huge, if you're not made, making those catastrophic navigational errors and what's taking the time is the combination of the climbing and then in places just difficult terrain. So everybody talks about brambles at Barkley um, and I'd say, for most part, they're not massive. They're not slowing you down a huge amount. Um, but there was one section this year when they were, I'd say, they did slow us down. Um, certainly uh, on some loops, we got it right and some loops, we got it very wrong. Um, and we definitely, our pace definitely dropped there. So I think those are the kind of combination of things. Talk to me a little bit about what Laz writes down as instructions and, 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 and is is that in any way useful to you uh, when he writes down his in his own way, how to get around the course? Um, yeah, you get about, um, you get about three pages maybe of, of instructions. Um, the, the classic thing, yeah, no, they are useful. They are useful fundamentally, but he has it, you know, he has his own um, personality to them. And, and his, one of his favorite things to write is sort of, you come to a high wall, which, which what they mean is a natural cliff. You come to a high wall, one way is much easier. One way around it is much easier than the other. Full stop. And then he doesn't. He doesn't say which way. It's up to you. To... <laughs> um, those are the classic sort of. Um, and it's full of humour. It'll say, you know, this is one of the flattest bits of the Barclay. You, you know, you should be absolutely hammering yourself here. Go as fast as possible. Um, one point. What was it? Yeah, he used to encourage you to sit down and admire the view. And so it, there's full of. It's full of humour, but it is. Yeah, it is mostly helpful um i think i found it i find it more useful once you've been there which is ironic but once you've been there then you you can understand it some of it's so kind of detailed for a short section has so many things that there's no way that you can remember it possibly and you've not got time to read it when you're out there i mean you're like holding both poles and breathing hard and there's no way that you're you might look at a compass but you're not going to be reading those kind of dense instructions so um it's more useful afterwards when you can go through and pick out the bits that actually are relevant in a way but so it's the another one of the ironies of Barclay you need to have been there before you can understand mm. the instructions <laughs> do you draw any of the map out when you get the map do you do you draw any of it out or what how do you go about dealing with that um, I just gl glanced at it on my wall there. Um, yeah, so you, yeah, you, you definitely need to spend time. Um, and we probably spent an hour or two, didn't we? Um, this year, yeah, plotting the route onto, onto a map and it does change, you know, change significantly this year. Um, and I thought it was quieter than the previous year. And I was listening to an interview, I think with Jared, um, by Gary Robbins. And he said, he thought the camp camp was about, about as quiet as it had ever been that afternoon because, of the significant change to the course and we're all sort of yeah trying to plot it onto our maps so i mean i was getting my map out more than the others because i'm i don't know just just trying to learn it and don't seem to memorize it necessarily as, as well as other people but yeah the, the map's pretty um that's very important I, I find and i'm getting out quite a bit but yeah the instructions is is another is another level um but the map map is um helpful at times certainly uh, let's quickly just talk about kit um and nutrition uh, jasmine <laughs> um I, I was watching the single track one that you did and uh, uh, he was out there uh, looking at your shoes all patched up. Tell me about, tell me about uh, what you wore, why you wore what you wore. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just, wore, I wore my mud cloth shoes, um, which I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I basically wore for both Barclays, partly because I had another pair of mud claws and actually maybe even two kind of that were like partially broken down used so I was just using those up um in between so these ones were kind of saved for Barclays so um yeah I think they've done three Barclays um and um they did four loops and then I had changed into a, a kind of spare pair for the for the fifth loop um just because it was nice to get into shoes that weren't full of mud um but um yeah the so the pair that I wore for most of it were a little bit patched because I realized they had these kind of slight defects in the upper so I actually sewed them and then patched over the top with a kind of um K tape and kind of glue that the green runners have in their kind of pair ups, like it's that's what it's called. I think repair kits. Um, 
so then and then I had yeah just the kit that I I guess I've been since you know I've been wearing the same kit for for several years now just because like in terms of t-shirts and shorts and things because they still work and I've I've done a bit of sewing up of of my leggings and three quarter lengths because they've got a bit holy at Barclay but it's wearing those same things and um and I actually had a rucksack that I borrowed from a friend because I'm not I've not got quite the right size rucksack and I wasn't going to buy one just for Barclay so borrowed her from rucksack which I used last year and worked okay um I, yeah. I and, love that you um, call it a rucksack oh pack whatever you want to call it no I no I no please like just carry on with that that's awesome <laughs> hydration vest i mean i mean you know, yeah to go with your cagoule i'm like yeah. a hiker at heart you know so yeah that's why i call a it a cagoule and a rucksack what kind <laughs> of cagoule did you wear <laughs> oh dear um i mean chafing issues you know kit that's well worn you, you know where all your chafing points are that's that wasn't a problem over 60 hours uh i had i had no like the only kind of i didn't have any chafing except the significant chafing induced by the briars. Um, yeah. um, and then I had, yeah, I just had a blisters between my big toe and my next toe, which I think happens to me every time I do one of these long races. I don't know, maybe I should try the kind of toe socks. Um, but that's that's the only place I had blisters, and my feet or otherwise. I think they're pretty hard. And, you know, I spent my childhood walking around barefoot um, whenever I could. So I don't know, they, like, they seem, I don't really seem to get that many blisters, but maybe I'm just lucky. You um so you you are no longer with Innovate. Is there is there less pressure to wear the Innovate? I mean, I imagine that uh, Damien was head to toe in Innovate clothing. Is that right, Demo? Probably. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I was wearing mainly Innovate stuff just because that's what I have, and I'm not going to buy new stuff if I don't need to yeah. buy new stuff. Um, it's just the rucksack I think that wasn't Innovate. Um, just because that's the one I borrowed from a friend. Um, but yeah, my other stuff was in a way as well. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, it, a, a lot of people, um, s- especially new runners, but, you know, I'm I'm the same. You you I If I, you know, the furthest I've ever gone is 100 miles. I want to be comfortable. I want to know that I've got good gear that's that's not going to rub, that's that's comfortable. I mean, you you are both you both seem very kind of, oh, well, you know, whatever about it. But other runners will be very picky and very. Um, concerned about choosing the right gear that's going to work for them. Uh, I mean, go on. Yeah. yeah well, I was only going to say, I think foot, well, footwear can be very individual. and But so often you go, I love this shoe. You you know, well, I don't say this anymore, but early on you used to say, I love this shoe, you should try this shoe. And someone else tries it and, and it just doesn't suit their feet. So feet can be very, very individual. And because I coach a lot of people as well, it, often, yeah, they're always saying, asking for recommendations and and yeah, different shoes suit different people. Um, so that's pretty individual. But other than that, I mean, uh, yeah, I've got, I don't know. I don't worry too much nowadays about, um, I don't know, socks or tops. Mm. Um, I mean, nutrition's another whole area of, 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 yeah. of debate, isn't it? But um, yeah, I mean, you'd hope, you'd hope most kit was good kit, I suppose. <laughs> Tell me about what you ate then. What was your what was your general uh, food of choice going around, both of you? Uh, after you, Jasmine. Uh, yeah, I don't think I got the navi- the food kind of very right. Uh, definitely, like that was definitely one of the challenges that I faced. I don't. Yeah, sometimes maybe you get it a bit better. I feel like I've had a few races where I've not got it very right. So maybe I just need to to work on that a bit I mean I had like a combination the first two loops were good and I actually even ate all my food I think on loop two and Damien gave me a, a Kit Kat um which I was very grateful for sometime I think it was on loop at the end of loop two um so like I had a mixture of you know I had pizza I had some frittata which I'd made which actually worked pretty well earlier on because I could it was fairly easy to eat um I had some yeah pizza frittata I had cheese and marmite um cheese and pickle sandwiches I had uh and then flapjack homemade flapjack I had like snickers bars some sweets and kind of saved gels for when I needed them 
think those were and some trail mix and um, those sorts of things um i'd just say that like as time went on I, I struggled more to eat things what really works for me is bananas when i come into the camp that's like the one thing that works really well for me and i don't even like bananas that much and most of the time i mean they're okay but i'm not like one of those people that has a banana every day not by any means but on races that's the one thing that like it's perfect just always always hits the spot um so um and in camp I kind of had things like had some rice pudding porridge pasta um yeah those sorts of things um but I struggled in the later loops to eat and that was definitely one of the challenges for me does the hot weather affect you when you eat does it you know depending on whether it's hot or cold I think it's easier to eat when it's cold rather than hot and it was definitely felt hot at times on this year um although it could have obviously been much hotter but it certainly felt hot. I was certainly dipping into the um the streams and things quite frequently on on the kind of daytime loops certainly we had those two yeah two two warm afternoons and I found I wasn't eating nearly as well um and some of the stuff that was appealing when it was cooler yeah wasn't wasn't so appealing um but I find I go yeah I mean liquid, liquid calories is is one, one sort of option there and i definitely want fruit more and and i suppose sugars and gels um but yeah i mean uh i made some well so my wonderful crew kareen made um bagels with uh yeah hummus and avocado and, and some of jasmine's pickle um actually jasmine i was curious to ask uh did you eat some of the pasta that i made because i heard a, a podcast or something and they were complimenting the look of the pasta you were eating and i was wondering if it was the, yeah, the, the I pasta had, i had knocked had together pasta. I had your pasta, I think, early on, yeah. I think I, I, yeah, with broccoli, broccoli bits in and stuff. Yeah, it was good. Oh, brilliant. It's incredibly rare I get any sort of compliment uh, regarding food preparation or cooking, so I'm, I'm going to take that. I'm going to tell my kids. Um, but thank you for the pickle again. <laughs> This is this is the one You're thing, welcome. the one success he's going to take away from Barclay this year. Come on. <laughs> I bought big, the reason I bought a big pickle is because last year we went there expecting to buy pickle and then we couldn't get any, could we, Damien? Um, it was and traumatic. Was a, there was a catalogue of kind of difficulties last year with shopping, including I asked Damien to get some coffee and he bought mushroom coffee. So I never I never actually dared try the mushroom coffee on last year's Barclay. So this year I bought my own coffee with me. <laughs> the heck is mushroom coffee, Damo? <laughs> I can't remember if it was... You know, it sounds nice, doesn't it? I don't drink coffee. That's the problem. Chicory that coffee wasn't a good sounds choice. nice. Sorry, Jasmine. That might have been the difference. You, you might have finished it that it, year. It wasn't the difference, coffee. Damien. Don't worry. I'm, I'm only telling <laughs> you. Okay. I, yeah. I, I apologise for the mushroom coffee. We'll, we'll never know what it tastes like. Well, well maybe I'll get some, yeah. Pick some up next time for you. Uh, Jasmine, you, um, you made it to loop five <laughs> and uh, you got further than any woman had got i mean you may as well have just called it a day there hadn't you how oh, did you was... feel getting onto loop five uh, it didn't honestly i've asked i've been asked you know were you aware of being the fastest loop three and the first person to woman to finish loop four and the first one to start loop five like that didn't even cross my mind like absolutely zero it was all about finishing um the only reason i thought about how fast i'd run loops through the three loops was because it I was that was the plan that was the target was to finish it in roughly 32 hours so that I'd had you know 14 each to do the final two so it was um yeah I didn't it didn't even cross my mind and um, what you know going out onto loop five the main thought was can I get round in the you know by 60 hours type thing and when I first went out I was like almost stumbling down the track um because I felt pretty bad um yeah. but it you know I ate my banana and then I actually said to myself out loud come on you're gonna do this and you know I did a bit of kind of a pep talk for myself out loud it's a nice thing you're in the forest you can talk to yourself as much as you like you can sing you can shout at yourself John Kelly does a lot of grunting noises. I joined him for I a bit of one in the night. Yeah, so um, yeah, you can do you can do as much as kind of shouting and yelling at yourself, and nobody will hear you. And um, there are pros and cons to being in the forest on your own. <laughs> so you, Laz said you looked uh, dead on your feet at the end of loop four. You were sat on a chair. You had a little sleep. You threw up big time, as far as I understand it. Um, <laughs> And then you headed out onto loop five. John Kelly uh, passed you halfway round and he was doing maths in his head. And he said, there's no way she can do this. Then he heard 
the what time you got to the tower and again he said okay well it looks like it's just a matter of how much over the cutoff she's going to be what the heck got you round in what was to be perfectly frank a ridiculously fast last half of that fifth loop I think I think it was just adrenaline you know it's interesting because like people keep telling me these kind of facts about how I guess lots of people were writing me off at the fire tower but I I really felt like I could do it like I I really thought thought I could do it you know I the only time when I really started to doubt it was the last kilometer when I was suddenly not sure that I could actually make it to the gate in time um but before that I I believed that it was possible so I think that's what kind of that's what kept me going the kind of the, the surge of adrenaline and I guess once I started I was just moving faster like the adrenaline came I was moving faster I was hitting those kind of mental points that I needed to reach at certain times like I knew when I wanted to get like it was pretty close I mean I was a little bit over the point when I wanted to get to the fire tower but not by that much and I still thought it was possible and I think that's just what kind of carried, carried on spurring me on like I was I was getting there you know and it was the last time I was having to do all these hills Damien will know that kind of the joy of like you know the thought like you know you must have felt the same the first time the first hill on that kind of that that fifth loop is mm. that finally you know that this is the last time and you're waving goodbye to this summit and then you're like I'm not going to see you again till you know hopefully ever um or whatever but <laughs> you're just you know um yeah so it was like it kind of is a positive reinforcement but mainly I just I, I just really thought I could do it I mean I that that's what comes home to me is your total self-belief from from 2022 and that first loop onwards the the total self-belief that you had that you could do it and I you know I I have to admit to you um that that I, I think I was probably one of the naysayers in the end so I I I tweeted when you got to the tower I tweeted this is going to be unbelievably tight and then I did actually tweet times up at about one minute to the hour and and then Keith tweeted that you'd fin and I went absolutely mental it was unbelievable I mean I was so it's 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 hard I mean I'm sure that you've had people say this to you Jasmine but but it is hard to put into words and I don't really know why it is because, you know, your spine uh, race was unbelievable. But for some reason, this finish uh, above all the others. And, you know, John Kelly said it's the it's it's possibly the best sporting event he'll witness. And I think you said, Damien, in in the flesh, you know, ever. And for me, sitting at home, looking at Twitter it was it was the best thing I've ever seen. It truly was. I was absolutely blown away, and I, I, you know, you 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 have to, you just have to hold that in your heart forever. That moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, it's an incredible thing looking back on it, and now it's like, now you could think you couldn't have written a better story. But at the time, it was very stressful. <laughs> yeah like i i like yeah it's it's so it's nice looking back on it knowing what the outcome is but at the time when you didn't know what the outcome was going to be then it was incredibly intense and like yeah a pretty pretty difficult um a pretty challenging kind of making it those final few hundred meters up to the up to the gate before the clock clock ticked over the hour yeah i mean and eventually when i saw the video of that yeah that was, that was and the screams and shouts from everybody to to get you there that was awesome really was da uh, damien um how how gutted were you and then how elated were you uh, how, you know what were those two extremes of emotion like for you um yeah i think i think when i located the located the book that had caused me trouble and, and realized how much time I had left. I it was pretty clear. It was unlike, I think it was that I felt I needed 10 hours from there and I probably had eight or eight and a half. Um, yeah, I felt, I felt, I suppose, very deflated and you're really tired as well. So it adds to it. And yeah, I felt deflated. And then I just kind of thought, well, what, you know, what can you make? What's the best you can make from this situation, I suppose. And it was to, although Laz, you know, I was a bit torn because Laz, 
does want you to come in if you if you know you can't finish he wants you to come in um uh, that is what i did the previous year and i did think i remembered some words from gary robbins from previous years of, of like this is your one chance to recce the recce the course because you, you can't get on most of it another any other day so i did yeah i did carry on and, and get to know some of the bits uh, a bit more but then got sleepy and had a snooze um and then yeah it was running in but then you know not far from the gate i started getting more anxieties about sort of well oh is everyone else finished and they're waiting for me will that be angry um and then i had this really moving moment of my own really when i was approaching the gate and because you're tired and you can't, or well, this is probably my problem that when I'm tired, I can't <laughs> work things out very clearly. I thought they thought I was finishing like I had the pages. Of course, I was coming from the wrong direction for starters and no one had seen me at the fire tower. So they all knew that I hadn't done it. But I, I almost wanted them to stop cheering because they were giving me a wonderful reception. And I actually went like this to, to make it clear that I haven't done it. I don't deserve um, these applause. But they, you know, they carried on anyway. And that was, um, yeah, that was really, really touching, actually. And then, and then it was probably a bit under an hour. Um, yeah, my first thing was, where, where's Jasmine? Has she finished? Um, and then, yeah, I got to see, uh, you know, two, two finishers come in and Sebastian come in as well, who had done similar to me, slightly better than me, but yeah, uh, an incomplete fifth, fifth loop. Um, and talking of singing, actually, where there was a wonderful moment, I forget which loop, but in the dark, we were all running on this the, a bit of Candy Ass Trail and um, he just started singing uh, in French. Um, uh, it just it just felt really surreal, but really perfect. It was beautiful. Um, so yeah, Sebastian, who those who don't know, has won Tour de Glaciers twice. Um, he, yeah, so he came in, and then and then I think there's maybe twenty minutes, fifteen minutes, ten minutes, five minutes, and and yeah, people were having the conversation. But it's still a great achievement, you know. I think most yeah. people, and yeah, people, um, most people. I don't want to sort of um, pretend. I'm still hopeful. I, I was still hopeful. I, I hadn't sort of, but but yeah, most people doing the maths. Um, and then we had this mini drama where John Kelly's young son, oldest son was wearing red like Jasmine and he's just down the bottom. You can see to like a corner and he comes around the corner and someone shouted runner, which means obviously runner coming yeah. in. So we all go, ah! oh, oh, it's not, there isn't, it's not Jasmine. But he carries on sort of waving his arms and and, and he's running across the road and we can't tell, is he just playing? Does he know what's going on? Is he trying to tell us something? And then, and then, yeah, and then Jasmine comes around the corner with, um, I think about three minutes, because I was just constantly looking. Uh, but it's quite a, yeah. it's quite a mean uphill. It's one of those uphills you really don't want, you know, in a hundred mile when no one's looking, you probably hike it, uh, but really, you know, you could run it. But actually the steepest bit's just around the corner as well. I think you've just done the more steep bit. And then it's, it's quite, it's quite an unpleasant hill. Me and John ran it on one of our loops and um, yeah, we were both cursing it. Um, so to run, run that at the end of however miles we think it is, possibly even 130. Um, and yeah, I ran down. I was, I was trying to give you a time update of like exactly how much time you had. But yeah, you were only, <laughs> you were only looking at one thing and that thing was yellow. Um, and But I could see there were two minutes then and I thought that's probably a minute, minute and a bit. Like that, that, I think we're OK. But it was, yeah. It was just magical. And then I don't know if you remember the next minute or two, but you sort of, you, Conrad was with you and he sort of cheered you to the gate and then sort of turned around and came back. I tried to give him a hug. So where, he sort of almost elbowed me in the face. I mean, you know? uh, on the video, Conrad's there with you when you, he's, 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 he's cheering you in and you get to the gate and then he runs off. Where did he go? Well, I think he was just letting Jasmine have yeah. her moment sort right, of thing. Okay. But, but Jasmine, you know, you were, you were, kind of hyperventilating or, or yeah you're in a massive oxygen yeah. deficit and and then so I actually sent it back I said I, I'm not sure if she's okay or not and no one's really doing anything and there aren't any med there aren't any medics there no um but there was an element of well for me at least was oh is she is she gonna she be okay? okay and then yes yeah, someone someone said we need a can of coke or something and three people dashed off and a can of coke arrived to um um and you seemed you know, it wasn't long before you were yeah, sitting yeah. up and, and, and yeah, but it was, yeah, yeah, just, just amazing to witness. Um, yes. Yeah. I've never, thank I've you for giving that to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. Can you thank remember, you. can you remember those moments? Um, yeah, but the kind of overriding feeling when I finished was just, I need to breathe, you know, like that desperate, just desperate need to breathe. Like I, like my body, I guess, was signaling to me, like, from the even from the storybook trail that I needed to slow down and I was like I'm not listening to you type thing and then just um if anything I asked it to go faster as I was trying to run up that hill um 
And uh, yeah, I guess every all the signals were screaming to me, you need to stop because I can't do this anymore. Um, and so I think, I, and yeah, I, I sort of now get why triathletes sometimes collapse like meters from the line. You know, you see those videos and I sort yeah, of yeah. get that now because um, if you're kind of, yeah. So I was just, I think in the first few few kind of uh, first minutes certainly I was just desperate to breathe and I was just yeah I was just breathing but um yeah I just wanted to say thank you to you Damien because obviously it's kind of been a shared journey and you've obviously coached me through all this these these years of trying to attempt this so um yeah it's like oh, blimey. Thank, thank you, you. I, I, well I, I sometimes feel like a bit of an imposter coaching coaching someone as talented and as absolute <laughs> nails as you because um yeah I even you know even without a coach you're going to do you're going to do very well anyway. Um, but um, yeah, that was that was incredible. Thanks. Um, yes. Nice one. <laughs> good bimble. Um, good bimble. Yeah. Uh, Jasmine, you um, talked about going up that final hill and saying, I never have to see you again. I, I know Damien's coming back. Um, do you want to do it again? Me? Well, you know... Honestly, I don't, I don't at the moment. I don't think that I'm. I'm not rushing back. Um, one thing I can tell you for sure, and I already feel a bit sad and nostalgic, is about not being there um, to see the whole. Yeah, to, for the whole thing, you know, like it's already kind of growing close to my heart in terms of. Yeah, it's a kind of. I guess anything that you do like that, where it's so hard, it, it's kind of. It's, you know, it's, it's a love-hate relationship, you know, and certainly there's a lot of love there as well in, in terms of the actual kind of time out on the course. It's very beautiful at times out there, you know, the sunsets and sunrises and um, just the time spent in the forest, but mainly the people, like the, the kind of Barclay family, like I'm going to really miss that. I'm going to miss being there next year and seeing all those familiar characters and sharing time out on the trails. Like, I mean, that was, it was an incredible privilege to get to share so many miles with so many fantastic people I mean, and kind people. You're um, part of that family now though. You know, you, you, there are, there are plenty of guys who, who I mean, Gary Robbins, uh, John, how do you pronounce his surname? Feggy? And I think. Yeah, that's what people like, Feggy, Feggy, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, he's been coming back for years, you know, and, and, um, Jared's always there and John's always there and uh, you know th th there are loads of guys that are always there um you can just you can just be one of those people you know you, you that you help the next generation yeah the problem problem for me is that I already struggled and I, I know Damien's got the same kind of dilemma I already struggled with the idea of flying to the states I'm trying you know obviously I represented like I'm part of the Green Runners I'm a co-founder of the Green Runners um we you know we're aiming to kind of try and reduce the impact of, of 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 us as runners on on the environment on and and on kind of contribution to the climate crisis and so one of the main pillars is how thinking about how you move and we know that traveling to races or events is 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 generally the biggest contributor to your kind of carbon footprint as a runner so for me flying to the states when i would said specifically that I was going to try not to fly to races if at all possible um was for me a kind of a big decision and it wasn't that happened something that happened completely lightly and I did it for Barclay because it's it, there's no getting away from it it's, it's unique there's nothing like it anywhere else um it's not a race you can replace with something else and um, there's nothing that you can do at home locally so I did it for Barclay but now that I've done it I just you know I, I feel I'm just satisfied you know I just I left it out yeah. all that I left it all out there. I did it. Um, I answered that question in my head of, is, am I capable of it? And I've, you know, and I've done it. Um, I don't even know as well for that reason if I went back whether I would be able to do it again or not because so much of what carried me through that last leap was that desperate desire to get it done and to prove it to myself. Um, and you see that in other people that have been there before. It, people can't necessarily do it every year. It needs a bit of time to sort of build up that desire to get it done again. Um, and I don't feel right flying for years you know multiple years each year to to the, to do that race for that reason and it's a big commitment for the whole winter you train for the whole winter essentially for this race and you know a family and there's other things in 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 to get done as well so there are for all other those things, things to get done. Done. that is that, absolutely yeah no I, I i that had uh gone out of my head really when i i said about going back every year of course i mean damien you put up with so much flack on on facebook and on social media for your stance um, you know, what, what, what do you feel about, um, going back? Is it how much of your, um, environmental consciousness 
is weighing heavy on a, a desire to finish this race? Yeah, I mean, I was hoping that would be sort of an added motivational element to, you know, sort of focus me at the, in the moments of, 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 you know, this means it's, it's um, yeah, financial cost and, and environmental cost and all, but also, you know, to some people, a reputational cost as well of, of um, or, or at least because of my connection to the Green Runners. Um, um, so I was hoping that would make, spur me on to, you know, get it done this year so you're not flying next year. Um, I mean, similar to Jasmine, I, yeah, I've pledged to, you know, only fly once a year maximum. I can't think at the moment, I have to be careful how I phrase this, I can't think of anything else that I would fly for. I don't want to be hold totally to that, but just in case, you know, I don't know, in a few years, some amazing idea comes up or some amazing new race. But at the moment, there's nothing else that I could think of that I would fly for. Um, and yeah, I, I would like to try one more time. But yeah, that would be my third. If I did fly the next year, it'd be, yeah, I did three years without flying. So that'd be my third flight in six years, which um, I think I think is pretty reasonable, um, really. Um but yeah, ideally, ideally wouldn't wouldn't you know get it done next time so I don't have to fly after that. Um, but yeah, I mean Jasmine and I both, if we're racing in Europe and stuff, we get yeah we get buses and trains and 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 or, or, or lifts. Um, and it'd be a, it'd be um, a heck of a triathlon, wouldn't it? To you swim the Atlantic, cycle down <laughs> to Tennessee, and then run the Barclay. That would no. Uh, what what is next for the Green Runners, uh, Jasmine? What's what's on the agenda? What are the next things that you need to achieve with the Green Runners? I mean, I guess it's been, Barclay in many ways has actually been really positive for the Green Runners. It's given us a lot of publicity, a lot of, like it's definitely entered a lot more people's consciousness. I mean, a large reason for doing all the interviews that I'm doing is whenever I can, I try to get a mention of the Green Runners in. Um, and so it's kind of reaching people in all areas of life and actually all over the world even. So I've done interviews in kind of all over the world for, for media outlets. Um, but in terms of what we're doing, I guess, yeah, continuing to spread that message just to kind of bring it home to people. It, it's just just more more generally a, across, as I say, the UK and across the world about those pillars of how you move, how you fuel, how you kit up and how you speak out. But largely, I think how you speak out, we know that how you speak out is, I think it's the most important one is because collectively, we, we're only going to kind of make a difference if we collectively demand quicker action and, more significant action on climate change um so like the green runners for example in sport we're you know calling on um trail running or you know running events to drop kind of um sponsors that are linked to fossil fuels for example um we had this petition to call on utmb who are obviously a huge kind of um leader in in trail running and lots of lots of event events might look up to them and 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 follow their example that we took to we called on, on them to drop das here as their headline sponsor so that sort of thing um we're involved heavily in the you know the climate relay um so and yeah so the kind of is far reaching but i'd say that kind of the the kind of big ongoing thing that the thing that's going to um you know see lots of change and new things coming in is that sort of pillar of how you speak out and that's where it'd be great to kind of get people involved and that you know that for people for, everybody's got different comfort levels in terms of speaking out but it might even just be a case of talking to your friends at your local running club and kind of spreading the message about the green runners and it doesn't have to be anything as dramatic as um you know um marching on parliament or, or whatever it is but there's all sorts Little of ways things. you can get involved uh, Damien, uh, just just on that, has there has there been any direct contact between yourselves and uh, Catherine Paletti or anyone at UTMB about Dacia? I mean, have you had any direct conversations yeah. with them? What? Yeah. What's, what's yeah, the deal? A few. <laughs> um, I guess I'm just trying to. Yeah, how much? Like, what? What? How much can we say? Um, I just to, just to add a couple of things to Jasmine. There is, yeah, we did get. We have had a significant bump bump in membership um after her run uh, uh, at Barclay um so obviously people yeah people don't know. see the debate I think most most you know reasonable people don't see the debate as simple as oh they flew so so you know it's all pointless um sure. so we've had a yeah, significant bump in membership and and you know people in America as well and yeah John Kelly joined us recently which which helps um and also yeah the running out of time relay is June I'm pretty sure which goes from um Ben Nevis down to Big Ben and this will be the third year and it, yeah, it was really quite joyous to be part of actually and it's like to be an activist all you're doing is kind of going for a run 
but that it does count for something and it you know it tries to check out the website because it tries to kind of weave around the country as much as possible and there are site you know you can cycle bits if you're injured or you know it, and, it, and it's quite a leisurely pace it's um it's brilliant to be a part of actually yeah um tell me the website told, oh I th- i'm pretty sure if you just put running out of time relay okay. um i'm pretty sure that would come up highly in the searches first two or three hits um yeah starts in june um yeah, UTMB, I guess, yeah, we, we sort of started off this, we, we felt strongly that high carbon sponsors aren't welcome in in, in running. Um, so we started this petition, it sort of, yeah, went like wildfire, really, I think almost 3000 people signed it within within a week or two. Um, and UTMB quite quickly got in touch and said, do we want to have a chat? So I think we, we um, yeah, I shouldn't say too much, but we've chatted to them three, if not four times. Um, um, I mean, I don't know <laughs> where are we now. I, I think I think there's. Uh, I'm struggling to say. I don't know if the chats have been productive or not. I think we both shared, you know, shared our views in a civil way. I, you know, I do applaud them for reaching out, and uh, as they have with the other, the several other disputes they have going on with other areas of oh, our yeah. community. <laughs> um, I, I think they listened, or at least acted like they listened. Um, I mean, if they've signed a, signed a certain contract for a certain amount of time, I mean, realistically, uh, uh, you know, they're not realistically going to end that contract early. But what we sought other measures like, could they be telling their other races or asking their other races to be aware that, you know, a high carbon sponsor is, is different to a sportswear sponsor, for example, and sends a very different message. Um, so, yeah, we haven't had a chat for a while. Uh, and, it, and, and I imagine it will be something we might pick up on again this year. Uh, we'll see. But um, yeah, we've had some chats. I, th- I think it, it made an impression on them, the depth of feeling um, that the petition generated. And I think that in itself is a really positive thing because it sends that message to other event organisers that actually maybe this actually is something that the running community really cares about. Um, and actually, you know, and for future decisions, whether it affects their sponsor currently or not, um, the hope is that it will affect future decisions on sponsorship, both by the UTMB group and other event organizers. So I think that's the key thing. Um, I, I, and it was, think... it was very heartening for us to see the depth of feeling and the kind of response it, it generated in the running community. So I think we've got a lot to build on. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the d- difficult thing. Um, I, you know, I, I um, picked up on when I spoke to them about the, one of the other issues, the Gary Robbins issue um i i did a video on the gary robbins thing they very quickly contacted me and and i felt i felt like it was a bit of a little bit of lip service but at the same time it i i felt like they did they did get it and whether it would affect like you say future plans and and future thoughts about what they because they they don't want to alienate the community do they but and they've managed well, to do that on quite, quite a, a few job, levels, really. haven't they? <laughs> yeah. Yes, interesting um, times. Interesting times. Um, talking about petitions, Jasmine, you know I've started a petition. <laughs> I have seen that, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah. I feel I feel like I'm getting far too much attention for the for the <laughs> for everything, far too much praise. Um but yeah, I saw that um um yeah, I was very touched. <laughs> By all the people uh, that signed. Well, it. listen, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not. It's not necessarily <laughs> about giving you, you know, a glitzy night out at an awards ceremony, but I, you know, um, hopefully, it's again, it's it's spreading to to some people who may not be aware of of what you've achieved. Um, the the message that you know, if you challenge yourself, you can do these things, and I know that you know, um, we haven't really spoken about it today, but empowering women to get out there stand on the start line of of ultra races and 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 do things that they perhaps were afraid of doing perhaps didn't think that they were worthy of of participating in and getting out there and and achieving stuff they didn't think they could yeah thank you very much yeah that's that's what i hope that that i'm able to spread that message now yeah so that's the that's that's a wonderful thing i think yeah but if you do win Sports Personality of the Year, um, you know, I want to thank you. <laughs> he wants to be the plus one. No, de- no, you can be the plus one, Damien. You can be the plus one. I don't want to go. Have you got a tux? 
No, these are my best clothes. <laughs> By the way, this this was this was me being quick and concise in my interviewing technique. It's only taken us an hour and ten minutes. What do you think? It's pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah. Cheers, Damien. Um, I'm going to let you go. Thank you very much, guys. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Um, appreciate your time, and I know we, we've been we've been a little while. Um, it's time for bed, isn't it? Thanks, Jasmine. Thanks, Cheers, Damien. Stephen. See you. Take, Take care. care. Bye-bye.